Hi, I'm Tim Naftali. I'm director of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library Museum here in Yorba Linda, California. President Nixon had every right to expect that he could control his tapes forever, and that if he didn't want to deed them to the United States government, if he wanted to destroy them, he could. So when suddenly the existence of the tapes becomes national news and is clearly of, of interest to the Watergate Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox, Who's been, put, who's been nominated for this position and, and, and confirmed in May of 1973, the issue is, will the president hand them over? And the last part of this story is a story really about a fight over the tapes. The president argues um, uh, executive privilege. Uh, these are my materials. If, if I were to hand them over, that would have a chilling effect on the, uh, on the ability of future presidents to get advice from their advisors. Um, and there's no um, constitutional precedent for me handing them over. And on the other hand, the prosecutor and the court arguing, uh, the lower courts in the beginning, arguing, well, no, what, this, is a com this is a criminal investigation. These materials are pertinent to a criminal investigation. The president says, well, I can't hand them over. In any case, there are national security secrets that will be re released. And so the courts are saying, well, no, no, we can let us listen and um, we have the clearances. I mean, we can listen to these things. We will differentiate between what's uh, clearly extraneous or harmful to national security and what is relevant to a criminal case. That is the struggle. And that struggle lasts from July of 1973 until the president leaves office 13 months later. This tells the story of that struggle. It also highlights something called the Saturday Night Massacre because the president uh, thought he had come up with a solution um, where he would get a friendly Democratic, a Southern Democrat, a guy named uh, Senator John Stennis, to listen uh, to the tapes. Um, it, he would release uh, transcripts. Stennis would authenticate the transcripts, and the transcripts would go to the court. These were tapes that were subpoenaed by the uh, court on behalf of the special prosecutor in the summer of 1973. Well, the special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, said, I, I can't accept that. I mean, that's second, second, um, second generation information. I need, I need in our system of government, in our system, legal system, um, defendants have the right to the information that is relevant to their case. And, and how could transcripts that are, haven't even been authenticated by the court be substituted for the real thing? Um, well, ultimately, this case goes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decides uh, that the president has to hand over the tape. Let, let's walk over here and take a look at our exhibit on the Supreme Court, where we lay out the debate as it was in the summer of 1974. Uh, we have uh, a quotation from James Sinclair, who was special counsel to the president. We, at that point, because Archibald, Archibald Cox is fired during the Saturday Night Massacre, as a result of the Saturday Night Massacre, he's replaced by Leon Jaworski, Jaworski's argument. And then the court's decision as uh, written by uh, Chief Justice of the United States, Warren Burger. Um, we also wanted to, to make clear to, the, um, to our visitors um, that this was a bipartisan. Now, first of all, the court, the court is beyond partisanship. It's one of the three branches of government. But we wanted people to see that the members of the court were selected by presidents of different parties. So we provide you with the names of the people on this court and uh, who nominated them. It was an 8-0 decision. Only Justice Rehnquist, who had worked in the Justice Department in the Nixon era, recused himself and didn't, didn't participate at all in the final uh, vote. It was an, otherwise, everyone else it was unanimous, including, obviously, the Chief Justice himself, who was selected by President Nixon. Now, the argument they make is that material relevant to a criminal case is not governed by executive privilege, that there are limits to a president's control over information. The president then had a choice to make. Was he going to accept the Supreme Court's decision, or was he going to try to fight it in some way? Well, the president decided, and gratefully for the, for the entire country, he decided to turn over the tapes. Now. Among those tapes that he turns over is a, a tape of a conversation on June 23rd, 1972. That's going to be 
known forever as the smoking gun conversation. But let me walk you back to the cover-up section of the timeline. And we highlight, we describe it as obstruction of justice. That's the way it was understood at the time and later. In three conversations on June 23, 1972, the president approves the use of the FBI to obstruct the F the use of the CIA to obstruct the FBI's criminal investigation. Extensive samples of Watergate evidence, including documents, oral histories, audio recordings, and vintage television clips, are available to explore online at nixonlibrary.gov.